The chief had been getting death threats. He'd counted six. And in a defiantly maskless prayer vigil in the city hall parking lot, several of the more reverent in the open-air assembly had been cuffed and hauled off on prize orders. But on this unsettling evening, another memory reached out to him. A day or so before he'd taken the yellow brick road, he had been led to a class by a member of the FBI Behavioral Science Unit. The lecturer had explained how the Bureau had been able to get into the heads of killers. They studied what made them kill and how to catch them before they'd kill again. What if, Bry asked himself with sudden alarm, a serial killer had attacked the four students. Three members of the behavioral analysis unit, two men and a woman, were also dispatched. Fry, however, wasn't done yet. He had been working restlessly through the night. But with the dawn, Chief Fry had taken an instant liking to his squared away military demeanor and promoted him quickly to corporal over other more experienced officers. And so nearly every morning at 7 a.m. in the weeks following the murders, Payne would be up at the front of the conference room in police headquarters, leading the case briefing, repository of information from selfies to Facebook pages and further stoked by the barrage of the raw theories and hearsay in the eyes of a killer. Part one, part three of three. An icon of horror. Meanwhile, as the hunt for the Elantra proceeded with tedious concentration, the no less discouraging challenge of finding a clue in the forensic evidence, a vast muddle of prints, blood, and DNA that had been collected in the house was brought vividly home. Body cam footage was released of a call at the King Road residence two months before the murders by a trio of Moscow cops in response to a noise complaint from an annoyed neighbor. At first view, the footage was deeply poignant. The house seemed to be nearly shaking with festive noise. Tyler Childers' feathered Indians boomed from the speakers. Kids were calling happily to one another. A giddy mix of bouncy, energetic voices. It was a Thursday night and there was a party going on. This is what it's like to be young. To more acerbic minds... The footage was a small, self-contained story about the tensions of policing in a college town. The kids, being kids, were seen giving the police a sly runaround. And the cops, being cops, retaliated with a display of petty vengeance. A confiscated stash of beers and Trulies were poured onto the driveway. Yet, this being Moscow, this house being destined for infamy, this burst of class warfare would have been an unexpected coda. One of the smirking cops spilling the booze would in time be part of the team that first discovered the bodies. Another would help load the cardboard cartons holding the murder student's belongings into a U-Haul for the grim trip to the police parking lot. To the informed and dispassionate view of the FBI scientific experts, however, the body cam footage was seen solely in operational terms. And it was dispiriting. It made clear that just about anyone and everyone had access to 1122 King Road. The door was always open. And a stream of people were constantly coming and going. The analysts moaned that there would be so much forensic evidence. It might be easier to determine who in Moscow had never been inside the house. Rather than having any realistic hope of ever finding a suspect. This body cam footage jumps up in my mind, too, as I stand across from the house on a cold, late night in December. The sky is gray, heavy with the promise of snow, and the pale, flat-colored house nearly disappears into this monochrome. The street is impossibly still. There are no extraneous sounds in the night. I try to imagine the house as it was in the video. Something vibrant and energetic. Tonight, that is impossible. All I see is a scene painted in Grisel. An icon of horror. 
Suddenly, I am trapped in a very bright cone of fierce white light. I am taken by surprise, stunned in fact, and my first startled, terrified thought. This is what it might have been like to be awakened without warning from a deep sleep and to find yourself staring at someone raising a knife. And then I hear a voice. You got to be careful there, it's icy. A black security vehicle had been parked kitty corner to the front door of the house, the car concealed by dark shadows. And the officer at the wheel, I now realize, had eliminated the auxiliary spotlight mounted on his door, pinning me in its harsh glare. Thanks, officer, I answer. I'll take care. And then I'm heading off, walking absently into the darkness out of the gulch and moving uphill. In the cold, my dark stocking cap pulled low on my forehead. My hands shoved deep in the pockets of my parka. I find myself standing on a flat, grassy ridge on Nez Pierce Drive. It's adjacent to the fraternity house where Ethan and Xana partied on their last night together. And now the snow has started to fall, a big torrent of big, thick silver and dark flakes. From my vantage point, I can look down at the house on King Road and see the snow has begun to cover it. The same falling snow that I know is blanketing the old red brick university buildings. The bars on Main Street. The roads that twist through the humpbacked northern Idaho hills. And the final resting places of the four dead students. And at that moment, watching the snow thickly descend, fresh white sheath, I cannot help but despair that the solution to the mystery that has agonized the small town will be forever hidden too. But I am wrong. For even as I am standing on that high plateau, a white Elantra, albeit the 2015 model, not one from the years cited in the police bulletins, is making its way east from the snows of Idaho. Its journey started in a parking lot outside a graduate student housing complex at Washington State University in nearby Pullman, just eight miles from my perch. At the wheel is Brian Christopher Koberger, and beside him, intriguingly, is his father. And all the while, the FBI has been covertly following along too. The hunted and the hunters were heading to an early morning rendezvous at a house deep in the Pennsylvania woods. For the case has been solved. Or so the authorities believe. The white speeding car in the Troy Road gas station video was one clue that had led them to Koberger. And despite the odds from the chaos at the murder scene, the technicians succeeded in extracting a telltale sample of DNA from the knife sheath. On December 27th, Pennsylvania law enforcement agents covertly rummaged through the trash at the Koberger family's white colonial house in Albrightsville. When items in the trash were analyzed by the lab, alarm bells started ringing. The matches to the DNA on the sheath were nearly identical to Michael Koberger, the suspect's father. His final piece completed the puzzle. An arrest warrant was issued for Brian Koberger. And what about the suspect? Here's what we know so far. A pudgy child and adolescent. A teenage taste for heroin, which he has allegedly conquered. A tendency to be rude and boorish in social situations, according to the complaints of those who cross his path over the years. And, not least, a fierce intelligence, revealed in both college and grad school classrooms. He has agreed to be extradited to Idaho, and on January 3rd, he appeared in a Monroe County, Pennsylvania courtroom. He looked first, at least to my eye, daunted by events. A sad figure in a red jumpsuit cartoonishly bulked up by the bulletproof vest the authorities had insisted he wear underneath. Still, he is also a big man, long-armed and limber, a presence. And in the course of the brief hearing, he appeared, again, to my admittedly distant view, to grow more confident. A fierce, purposeful determination is, I decide, revealed. And I wonder, 
Does Koberger, a man who seems to see himself as the smartest person in the room, have some legal trick up his sleeve? He will stay in trial in Moscow on four counts of first-degree murder as well as burglary. But even before his journey west, Jason Labar, his court-appointed attorney in Pennsylvania, is fighting back. Mr. Koberger is eager to be exonerated of these charges and looks forward to resolving these matters as promptly as possible. He insisted in a statement released to the press. Mr. Koberger has been accused of very serious crimes, but the American justice system cloaks him in a veil of innocence. He should be presumed innocent until proven otherwise. Not tried in the court of public opinion. Yet, while much remains to be sorted, it is clear that one corner of Koberger's life has been lived as a graduate PhD student in criminology, someone who has consciously studied the vagaries of evil. In fact, in his purposeful search for knowledge, he had sent out a research questionnaire to convicts asking for their help. I am inviting you to participate, Koberger wrote, in a research project that seeks to understand how emotions and psychological traits influence decision-making when committing a crime. In particular, this study seeks to understand the stories behind your most recent arrest with an emphasis on your thoughts and feelings throughout your experience. Was this simply a grad student's academic inquiry? Or was a would-be killer asking the professionals, suppose you wanted to commit the perfect crime, how would you do it? And now, under arrest and awaiting trial, he has quite possibly discovered that there is no such thing as a perfect crime. This concludes part one of Howard Blum's In the Eyes of a Killer read-along. I hope you've enjoyed part one, and I'm looking forward to seeing your comments in part two. Be sure to check out my other videos and playlists for more true crime content. And if that's not enough, you can join our Patreon. Don't have a tinfoil hat? It's okay. We'll make you one. It's that easy. See you guys in the next video. See you later. Bye.